Lord, open our hearts and our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that, as, in scripture, as scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may rejoice in you always and live in fresh expectations of hearing the good news of your coming among us. Amen. Thank you, Bob. Bob, I'm just going to ask you to stay up here. You're going to read the scripture, aren't you? Come on back up here. We're going to do something a little bit different. By, by the way, let me just say, choir, that was beautiful. Uh, let's, just, um, let's just thank them for that. And our scripture this morning uh, ties into what they were talking about, and we're going to continue to talk about that. And we're just going to ask Bob to read right, off, um, right up front, and I'm going to ask you to open your Bibles to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to be reading verses 4 through 7. And uh, Bob, go ahead and read that. And if you would leave your Bibles open, we're going to be studying uh, this text together this morning. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. All right. Thank you, Bob. When I was growing up, I used to go to vacation Bible school at my grandparents' church. It was a small Methodist church in town, and we always attended vacation Bible school there. And I remember singing a song. I won't sing it for you this morning. It would just mess up what the choir did if I sang. But you, do you remember the song? Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And as kids, we would stand there and we'd clap and sing this, right? Do you remember that? Did you used to sing that? And then it would say again and again, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. But what does that mean? I mean, as a kid, I, I would stand there and sing it, and we'd be all happy about it, right? But what, what do we really mean when we said to rejoice? If, if you're looking at the word, you might be smart enough to see the word joy embedded in that, rejoice. So you might say it's simply the verb for joy, right? To have joy. And you would be right because the dictionary defines the word as to feel or show great delight in something. That's what it means to rejoice. But Paul says in this scripture, rejoice in the Lord always. And then what does he say? Again. I'll say rejoice. Now, anytime a writer of Scripture says a word twice, we should pay attention to it, don't you think? And so Paul is telling us to rejoice. Now, later on, I'm sorry, earlier on in this letter to the Philippians, he said in chapter 3, verse 1, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. So he's already told them to do this, right? So really, this isn't the first time he said this in the letter. And by the time you get to chapter 4, he's saying it again. But this time, he adds the phrase, always. Now, this would be consistent to what he wrote to the church in Thessalonica. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Paul told the church in Thessalonica to be joyful, how often? Always. There, he says it again. Now, when you think of joy, you think of what it means to be joyful, you think of good times, right? We put the word up at Christmas time, right? We, well, it's a happy time, right? And we kind of equate the word joy and happy. So you're joyful maybe when, you know, your team wins a game. Or you're joyful when you get a job promotion. Or you're joyful when you pass those final exams, right? At the end of the semester. Or the semester's over, either way. You're joyful. Or you, you think of that. Now, now, no one has to tell you to be joyful during those times, do they? You just are. But Paul says, be joyful always, at all times. Now, did you know that when Paul wrote this letter, do you know where he was? He was in prison. Exactly. He was in prison awaiting a trial. And for all he knew, he could receive the death penalty. And this could have been the end of his life. And he is writing these words to rejoice in pretty poor circumstances, wouldn't you say? But he says it twice. And let me, let me kind of just correct our understanding of joy this morning. Because the word joy and the word happy are not the same words. They don't mean the same things. 
In fact, happy, you think, is often tied to your circumstances. Have you ever had anybody ask you, are you happy? What are they asking you? They're asking you if life's going well, right? If your relationships are intact. If, if your kids are doing well in school and relationally. Then, then you say, I'm happy, right? But happiness and joy are very different words. Because joy is much deeper than happiness. Joy is something that is not rooted in your circumstances. Now, let me remind you, when Jesus sent the disciples out for ministry in Luke chapter 10. Do you remember that story? He sends them out, and he's really um, really kind of giving them kind of a, a test run for what they're going to be doing once he's gone. But you remember that story? Jesus sends them out, and he gives them power to do miracles, okay? And they come back, and they're all pumped up because they were able to perform miracles. They were able to cast out spirits, and Jesus instructs them. Look what he says in Luke chapter 10, verse 20. He says, look, don't rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Same sort of thing there, isn't he? Jesus says, look, rejoice not in your circumstances, because there's going to be times when you go out there and it doesn't work out so well, okay? But rejoice rather because of what God has done, because your names are written in the book of heaven. So for both Paul in Jesus, this admonition to rejoice, to tell you and I to rejoice, is not rooted in our circumstances. It's rooted, rather, in what God has done for us. In fact, sometimes life's going to be real good, okay? And sometimes life's going to throw you a curveball. But Paul says, rejoice, how often? Always. When life is good and when life is bad. Paul and Jesus both warn us not to place our eggs in the basket of circumstances. Because that's a pretty fragile basket. But to rather place our eggs in the basket of God's love and provision for us. And what God has done for us. Now, we keep reading here and we see Paul is telling the, the believers at Philippi what to do. He tells them rejoice, rejoice in the Lord always. And then in verse 5 there, you see, he tells them to let their gentleness be known to everyone. Now, when you're reading this, you might think that's a little disconnected with the whole idea of rejoicing. Because rejoicing and gentleness, they don't seem to have a lot in common. But what's Paul getting at here? Now, I want to show you the ESV translation of this verse. Verse 5, let your, the ESV says, your reasonable, reasonableness be known to everyone. So that looks different than gentleness, doesn't it? And it gives us a clue, doesn't it, that the Greek word here it might be a little difficult to translate. If one group of people translates it gentleness, another group of people translates it reasonableness. Now, this Greek word is an interesting word. And it was often used in Greek literature to speak of a judge in a court, who is gentle or reasonable in his behavior or in his verdict. Now, what does that mean? That, that means he, he's not irrational. He's not flying off the handle. He's simply hearing the case and distributing a gentle or reasonable or fair sort of verdict. You see, that's what this word means. So, what is Paul telling the Christians here? He's telling them to live in such a way in which their reaction to what happens to them is reasonable. It's fair. It's gentle. Now, we know Paul is writing this letter from prison. We know that what is about to happen to the church at Philippi is that they're going to be persecuted. Okay, So Paul is speaking to this. Rejoice in the Lord always. And he says, look, as the circumstances come in your life that aren't so good, respond to them rationally. Not out of revenge, not out of anger, not flying off the handle, but be gentle and be reasonable in the way you respond. And that would surprise the persecutors as they saw the Christians responding in that way. Now, Think about this for a minute. How could someone be persecuted? Maybe their family member is killed. Maybe somebody they love is killed. How could they endure that and not respond in anger or bitterness? That's pretty tough, isn't it? 
how could someone be persecuted and not want to retaliate? I mean, that's kind of crazy, you might think. And, and that could only happen if one is able to refocus their attention on God and what God has done rather than on the circumstances that life brings them. Remember, Jesus told his followers, don't rejoice that th these miracles have happened, that the demons have submitted to you. Rather, rejoice that your names are written in the book of life. And in the same way, Paul says to the Christians at Philippi, rejoice always in all circumstances. You see, for the last several, several weeks, through this season of Advent, we've been talking together about Jesus coming back, haven't we? About Advent, about the anticipation of wanting God to come back. We, we, we hear it referred to as the day of the Lord or Christ's return. And this is a season of anticipation. And that's what Paul is pointing to here. You see, here's the reality. Everything that we experience in this world, whatever it is, needs to be measured against the joy of Christ's return. Now, i got to be honest. I don't always do this. i, I got to be honest. I seldom look at my life's circumstances and compare them to Jesus returning. Wouldn't, wouldn't you agree? We don't always do that. But, but let's bring this for just a minute into the context of the Christmas season. Let, let's say you're a child, okay? And you're in your bedroom and you're playing with your toys. Maybe they are Star Wars toys or Lego toys or dollhouse or video games. I guess it would depend on your interest and how old you are, right? But you're a kid, you're in your room, you're playing with your toys. But let's say one of your toys breaks. How are you going to respond to that? Maybe you get upset, maybe you cry, maybe you get angry. But let's say, like we are today, we are just a few days from Christmas. A and you know that at Christmas time, you're going to get new presents, right? You're going to get more toys. And it might make a difference how you respond because you might not worry about it too much because in a few days, you're going to get new toys. That's what Paul wants us to keep in mind. And that's what Jesus wants us to keep in mind. To get this sort of perspective on our life circumstances. Jesus told us to rejoice. Why? Because our names are written in the book of life. Paul told us to rejoice because the Lord is near. There are these bigger realities out there, and we often have trouble grasping them because we're focused on the circumstances of our life. Ask yourself the question, in a hundred years from now, is what I'm worried about going to really matter? In a hundred years from now, the things I get worked up about... Is it really going to make any difference? Our name's written in the book of life. That's going to matter, right? Jesus returning, God coming back, and making all things right. That's going to matter, right? Now, gaining this perspective, being able to refocus in such a way in which we're anticipating Christ's return, we're anticipating what He is going to do, I've got to admit, that's not an easy thing to do. Living in, in this sort of anticipation is difficult. It requires us to really shift our worldview, doesn't it? Let's keep reading here because I think Paul gives us some instructions on how to do this and how this works out. He, he doesn't just leave us with these words, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. He doesn't stop there. He keeps going. He gives us more information, greater detail in how we put this practice into our lives. Look with me at verse 6 here. And this is, I think, the key verse here. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Now, this is a loaded verse, but it's a powerful verse. Look at what Paul's saying here. First of all, he tells us not to be anxious. Now, that's easier said than done, right? Not to worry. But he tells us rather to submit our anxieties to God, give them to God. Now remember, where's Paul writing from? He's writing from prison. How do you not get anxious about that? I mean, if you're awaiting trial that could possibly result in your death, how do you not get anxious about that, right? 
But Paul says, rather take the things that worry you, take the things that are weighing you down, and submit them to God. Pray about them in prayer and petition. And notice he says, with thanksgiving. Now, this is an important part of this. You see, gratitude is a key piece of this thing. If we're going to present our request to God, we're going to give our request to God, and we're really going to trust Him to take care of them, we've got to first do that with gratitude because we've got to see what He's already done, right? How many of you can see in which God has provided for you in the past? God has worked the things out in the past that you've been so worried about? How many of you have had times like that where God's done that for you? Yeah. You see, if we're going to do it again, we've got to remember that He did it the first time, right? And so this is a part of it. As we present our anxieties to God, we have confidence that God can take care of it because he did before, right? And and, and in a personal sense, that's true. But in a larger sense, that's even true. In a cosmic sense, that's true, right? God's been faithful in the past to provide for his people. And, And as we're in this season of Advent, we know he's faithful because he came, didn't he? He gave himself on a cross for us. He died for us. He rose from the dead. God has been faithful. Therefore, we can take our anxieties. We can place them at his feet. And we can trust that he will be faithful in the future, right? So whether it's the tiny things that we worry about or whether it's the cosmic realities, we are to submit our anxieties to God. And then look what Paul tells us in verse 7 there. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. If we're willing to bring our anxieties to God, to give them up to Him, right? There's a promise here. We are promised peace. Now think about these two words for a minute. Anxiety and peace. Which one do you want? Right? Not too hard. Would you be willing to trade your anxiety for peace? Pretty good deal, isn't it? That's what is promised here. And and notice the peace that we gain is a peace that transcends all understanding. It's pretty powerful, isn't it? Not just this peace like, oh, everything's going to be okay. But it's a peace like, I don't even understand this peace. I don't even get it. It doesn't even make sense to me how I'm peaceful about this. And it's a peace that we're promised will guard our hearts and minds. And it's rooted where? In Christ Jesus and what he has done for us. Again, the focus of our anxieties would transition. And when I entitled this message, Refocus. That's really what it's about. It's about refocusing our anxieties, our minds, away from our circumstances, and rooted in Christ Jesus. Trading our worries for a peace that is beyond our understanding, rooted in the work of Jesus. We're going to do something here, and I'm going to ask Troy to come up uh, here and share with you a minute. We're doing something different. We, we, we were going to have a testimony this morning, and Matt had an idea a few weeks ago uh, that I think is really cool. And I'll let Troy tell you a little bit more about it, but instead of just having someone come and share a testimony, my idea was to say, let's have someone share a testimony about something they're worried about and, and then have, have them describe how God took care of it. But instead of that, about a month ago, I gave Troy this scripture, and I said, we're going to be preaching about this scripture on December 16th. Would you commit to read this scripture, to pray over this scripture, and then just share what God showed you in this text this morning? So, Troy, would you share with us? Thank you. Um, Since this is a combined service, um, I know some of you in here, some of you I don't. Um, I mostly go to first service. So I've been a member here for about four years. My wife, Cindy, and I came together. And... um, so some backstory on this is when um, Wade presented me with this, I laughed because I was at a leadership council meeting and, and I said, this is so ironic. And the backstory on this is um, I, I'm employed at Ball State University as an athlete trainer. I take care of the men's basketball team there. And um, after every pregame meal, we have a chapel. Coach Taylor is very focused on, on molding these young men, not just from a basketball standpoint, but from a personal standpoint and a spiritual standpoint as well. And Eric Nodal, who's our team chaplain, um, it was the first game of the year, it was on a Sunday, came in and did this chapel, and this was the passage he did it on. We have a lot of freshmen on the team this year, and, um, and he wanted to kind of give them some, some focus and some, and some scripture to help them relax 
and, and take the focus off the, what their nervousness and their anxieties were for this first game. So when Wade came to me and said, hey, this is what I'm thinking about doing. Would you be willing to do this? I laughed because I said, it's really interesting that God set the table for this yesterday. Because basically I sat there in the chapel and I said, that's a really cool passage. It's one of my more favorite ones that I've enjoyed over the years. And, and um, I really told Eric, I said, this, this is really cool and it fit well for what we were trying to do. And then to come back on a Monday evening and Wade goes, hey, this is what I want you to do. And I looked at it and I just went okay, Lord, I guess you want me to do this. And uh, I've learned over the years as a Christian, sometimes God does those things to kind of say, I need you to do this for me, and, um, and I'm going to keep probably pestering you until you do it. But so, so I've learned to just accept it and move on. Um, so basically, when Wade came to me to do this, I, I said, oh, sure, I can do this. I can, I'll get up early in the morning, and I'll pray, and... and um, and I'll take this time and, and really think about how I'm going to do this. And um, so for the first week, I, I, I tried to get up early in the morning and do this, but, but I'm a parent of a, a three-year-old and a one-year-old. And my schedule is not necessarily their schedule. And therefore, um, I came into a, a kind of a, a situation where um, finding time to have some quiet time to really do this was very difficult. But... Um, Again, God intervened in a very unique and, and interesting way. Uh, we've been very blessed to, uh, to live on four acres in northern Henry County um, that we've been there for over a year now. And um, growing up in the country like I did on a farm, it's been a true blessing to have this property to kind of kind of have to, to, to decompress and, and, and commute from and a place to, to raise our children on. And um, so one Saturday morning, um, or in, the, in that time, if you want to go ahead and roll the first slide, in March we decided to get a dog. And Pepper is a, a true free spirit. Um, she's a, she's a, we, we figured out she's a greyhound, border collie mix. And um, one of her favorite things to do out in the country is to basically explore it and run around and, and not necessarily stay within the borders of our four acres. Um, so one Saturday morning, our next door neighbor came over and said, hey, you know, um, I've got, I'm trying to hunt deer and I've got traps set up on our property and your dog keeps coming over and messing stuff up basically. He was very nice about it, um, but I took, I took it as an opportunity to be a good neighbor. So we decided to tie up Pepper uh, through deer season um, to kind of keep her from running around. But one of the deals of tying her up was that I was going to have to walk her in the morning. Um, so that's what I would do. If you want to go ahead and read the next, right, roll the next slide. So this is our property north of Newcastle. Every morning I would get up and, um, and hook Pepper up to a leash, which I think is so funny because we live in the country and I've got to leash my dog to take it a walk. But we would walk around the property. And one morning I said, you know what, I'm trying to find this time to pray. This is a perfect opportunity to pray. And this is what I would pray with. The glory of God's communal nature um, with the sun coming up. And so that was my prayer time. Again, I think very uniquely, God's plan to provide that time for me to do this. So I prayed over four areas. And I'm not going to really reveal all those areas to you today because some of them were personal, uh, some of them were professional, and, and, and one of them was specifically for this church. But what God revealed to me in that time, um, basically my worries, my, my anxieties, um, were transformed into peace that God's will would be sufficient and I would be open to his answers. That, that the idea that, that my worries and my anxieties and everything that I was stressing about or worried about in these areas that I was praying over, God slowly transformed um, those anxieties into peace and that understanding that, that whatever his answers are, we're going to be good enough. And trusting in those answers and those provisions was going to be good enough for whatever came about and that we could, I could handle those things and take them on in the faith and knowing that God's, this was God's will to do this. Um, because of this peace and, and the openness of my mind to accept God's will for this, um, I was free to think through and respond to the cause of my worries. Um, in the medical profession that I work in, I'm always searching for the cause of something. I do not necessarily like to treat symptoms or you just have pain, so I'm going to take that pain away. I'm always searching for the cause of what is causing that. And 
I really have never applied it in my life in this aspect, but this really, one morning as I'm walking along, I'm thinking about this, and I go, why wouldn't I want to attack the causes of what's going on with this? So it allowed me to set up um, kind of plans or thought processes to basically kind of attack these causes and try to find ways that, that God would allow me to, to work through these worries and these anxieties and set forth a foundation that hopefully I can follow, <laughs> but, but, you know, trust in the God in providing and provision to, to look upon these concerns and worries and turn them into something very positive and something that I can work on and something that I can work on together um, with my family and my professional life as well. I also felt that God was directing me in areas that I would not be able to go to had I been more focused on my worries and anxieties. And because of this, my faith grew in the fact that his provision for us is greater than anything we can ever imagine. That his solutions, his ideas, his basic wishes for us in our own lives, um, we sometimes get very tunnel vision about something we want or something we want to do, or it should look this way, or it should look that way. And sometimes we don't open ourselves up to what God's will may be for us, that we, don't, we lose out on the opportunity to see his glorious provision for us in, in whatever area that it is. So in that process, as I let things kind of develop and, and grow and, and just have the openness to just kind of open my eyes and see, I realized that that provision was, again, more glorious than I could ever imagine. Solutions that, that to problems and, and anxieties and worries that I had, um, he was blessing me and my family and my friends and coworkers in ways that I couldn't see before until I kind of opened up and saw what his provisions are. And it's still tough. There's still some things that, that I haven't seen totally through, and I think it will take time to see that. But at least I'm in a place and a position to, to see those types of things. And I think all of us can, can learn from that as well. One of the prayers that, that, um, that I specifically focused on out of the fourth areas I prayed over were for the financial issues of this church. On leadership council, um, I've understood and seen the budget process and was in the budget meeting when we, when we talked about this deficit that we, that we talked about this morning. And, and obviously that weighed on me, that worried me, knowing, knowing what's going on with that and, and, and the things that have to go through to examine that and to see what we need to do as a, as a congregation, as a church, to try to, to alleviate that as much as possible. And so I, I prayed over this probably as much as I, as I prayed over the four other three areas. Um, but for me, it was the toughest thing to kind of see some of God's provision through that. But I did see signs, and signs that may not necessarily be right in front of us at this point, but I did see signs and opportunities for that, and that's what I really want to share with you right now. Um, I think that stewardship is now in the conver conversation of our congregation. It's going to be talked about. It's going to be discussed. It's going to be debated. There's going to be some heated talks about what we should do or how we should do it or what our purpose is uh, for things with this church. But at least it's in the conversation. It's out there. People are recognizing it. They're seeing it. They can act upon it if it's out there and discussed. And in hopes of, as a, as a relatively new member of the church and understanding the history of this church and what this church has gone through, um, that's what we need. We need conversation. We need talks amongst each other as a, as, as a, as a church to resolve these issues. And in a, in a conversation of respect and an understanding that we are all together in Christ and we want to have this purpose of this church to serve the community and ourselves um, in a place that, that we can share that, that love of Christ to everyone. Also, the church has grown in new attendees and new members. Um, we can obviously see that in this room right now. Um, this is an opportunity to take the blessings of people that have been in this church for a very long time, that love this church, that love everything about what this church was, is, and can be, and share that love and that passion 
to our new attendees and our new members that are here and guide them and mentor them and counsel them so that this church can be sustained beyond their lifetimes. And I think that's the thing about um, any organization. I, I'm, a, I'm a history buff. And the one thing I, that I love about history are the people that, that set the standards, that, that set the base and the foundation for an organization or a group, and they take that passion and they translate it into the next generation. And I see an opportunity. I see something glorious that the Lord will provide for us here in the members that we have here that have been here for a very long time that love this church and translating that into the new members and the new attendees and counseling them to carry on the mission of this church. My prayer now, um, when I go out on my walks with, with Pepper, um, my prayer now is for God to grant wisdom and openness to ideas by our leadership, our new leadership, our existing leadership, and this congregation to allow the church to be sustainable. I think it's important that, that our prayers are not for God solve this $40,000 problem that we have. I don't think that's the solution. I think we need wisdom. I think we need, um, we need uh, openness. We need, we need conversation. We need togetherness to work through all this. And that's my prayer now for this church and for the congregation. I'm going to continue to pray for the other three areas that I'm in, plus everything else that I usually pray for. Um, but, um, but for the most part, I think it's important that we all think about that and all think about how we can, that we can use um, this passage of Scripture to guide us along our journey as we go through this. Thank you, Wade. Thank you for sharing, Troy. And uh, Troy and I had lunch one day and talked about the way in which he was uh, putting this uh, scripture into practice in his own life. And I know he didn't share all the personal concerns uh, this morning, but it, just to take those things, to give them to God. This is a powerful text, wouldn't you, wouldn't you agree? We need to understand that as Paul is writing these words, he's not sitting in a padded mansion overlooking the Mediterranean Sea telling us to rejoice in all things. He's writing these words in very difficult times in prison, awaiting trial. He's writing to a group of believers who are going to need to experience this transformation in their own lives. They're going to need to refocus. They're going to undergo intense persecution. They're going to be called to rejoice in all circumstances. They're going to be called to live in gentleness or reasonableness, not retaliation. They're going to be called to place their anxieties in God's care, and they're promised to receive a peace that will transcend their understanding might seem like a pipe dream. It might seem like this is something that's beyond us. But let me challenge us this Advent season to focus on what is coming. Like a child with a broken toy just a few weeks before Christmas. They're going to be new toys. Better toys. And by the grace of God, I can proclaim to you and we can proclaim together, O come, O come, Emmanuel. Right? God is coming. God's been faithful to past generations. He was faithful to come the first time. He's going to be faithful to return and make things right, restoring all that he started in Genesis. May we learn to live in this story, into this reality. May we learn to be a people living in this in-between from what God did and what He's going to do. Living in the anticipation and all the while taking our personal anxieties and our cosmic anxieties and placing them in His care. And when we do, we'll find we'll be able to rejoice. It'll be more than just a vacation Bible school kid singing it. It'll be reality for us rejoice rejoice in the Lord always and again I say rejoice I, I'm not sure what God might be saying to you this morning maybe there's somebody here this morning that you just weighed down this morning you come into church this morning and you're just so weighed down with the anxieties of life and you just need to shed that this morning maybe God would be calling you to come and, and to pray up front and say, God, I just give them to you. God, I want, I want to trade my anxiety for peace. Maybe 
as Troy spoke about, there would be some who would come and pray for our church as we might be in what you might consider an anxious time, not knowing where things are going, having suffered loss from um, the past and not sure what's going to happen in the future. God, we can, we can take these anxieties and place them at your feet. And maybe you need to come and pray for the church this morning. Maybe there's some other need, some other person in your life that is suffering from anxiety. And maybe this morning you would take just a few minutes and pray for that person and pray that God would be able to refocus that person. So we're going to stand and sing here. I'll be standing to the side here. If you'd like to pray with me, you come and pray with me. If there's a decision you'd like to make, if you'd like to join this church, now would be the time that you would come. We're going to stand and sing uh, together. We've been holding out um, singing Christmas songs because it's 